Good afternoon and welcome to today's machine design webinar. Today's topic is how to select the proper pin for your application, sponsored by Spiral. I'm Bob Vavra with Endeavor's Design and Engineering Group. Let's talk about how you can participate in today's presentation. If you have any technical difficulties during our session, please put a question into the question window and our technical experts will help you out. We also recommend disabling any pop-up blocking software or extensions in your browser as these can cause issues with the webinar player. We also welcome your questions during our event today and we'll get to as many of those as we can during the Q&A session that'll follow the main presentation. So feel free to send in your questions at any time. To do so, simply type your question into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. Also be aware that today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Machine Design website within the next week. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. So let's meet our presenters for today. Christy Jones has 27 years of experience helping customers enhance their competitiveness by improving product quality, simplifying the assembly process, and reducing costs through fastener and component design. During her tenure at Spiral, she's worked as an Applications Engineer, Operations Manager, North American Sales Manager, and is currently the Director of Marketing and a Vice President. She presents at several technical seminars each year and is the author of many articles focused on fastening, joining, and assembly. She received her Bachelor of Science in Manufacturing Engineering degree from Worcester Polytechnic Institute and her Master's of Business Administration from the University of Rhode Island. And Jeff Greenwood has 10 years of engineering experience and is the product sales engineer for the PIN product group at Spiral. In his role as product sales engineer, Jeff has helped various companies around the world design and implement innovative fastening solutions. He's also been a key contributor with R&D projects, resulting in the introduction of creative fastening solutions for the industry. He also graduated from Worcester uh, with a uh, major in mechanical engineering and received his master's of business administration from the University of Massachusetts. So thanks to both of you for joining us today. Christy, we're, you're going to get us started and we're looking forward to this presentation. Thank you, Bob. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today to discuss how to select the proper pin for your application. My name is Christy Jones. I'm the Director of Marketing and Vice President for Spiral, and I'm joined by my colleague, Jeff Greenwood, who's the Product Sales Engineer for our PIN product group. Good afternoon, everybody. So before we get started, I hope you noticed the operative word that I emphasized in the title slide of the presentation being how to select the proper PIN for your application. And I say this because there are literally thousands of different standard PINs to choose from that eliminate tooling and development charges and ensure both prototype and production parts ship from stock. Now, of course, you can design a custom pin for your assembly, but when you do this, custom anything almost always guarantees that you'll be paying more money and that you'll have longer lead times. So over the next 30 minutes, we'll cover common types of pinning applications, how to select common standard types of press fit pins, features and advantages and disadvantages of each pin type, how to select the proper pin for your common applications, and then we're going to go over some different features of the actual assembly that also affect pin selection, such as what is the force on the pin and whether or not it's a static or dynamic load. What's the host material of the assembly components, et cetera. So first, a brief overview about Spiral. Spiral is a global manufacturer of engineered components used for fastening, joining, and assembly. <clears throat> You come across Spiral every day and you don't even know it because our products are hidden inside other companies' assemblies. We have 12 major product lines. Each one is designed to improve the product quality, simplify the assembly process, and or reduce the overall cost of the assembly. We're the only company who designs and manufactures both our engineered fasteners and our installation equipment. Our focus, though, is not just about supply applying high quality product, okay? It's about partnering with our customers as early as possible in the design stage to help design not only the fastener, but also to make the critical recommendations between our products and your assembly so that the assembly goes together and stays together for the intended life of the assembly. To accomplish this, we have applications engineers locating around the world, ready to work with you on your new or existing applications. So today's web chat will focus on pins and specifically how to select the proper pin for your application. Here are the most common types of pinning applications. So first, 
is when pins are used as hinge pins or pivot pins, such as in this heavy equipment control pedal. Next, pins are often used to fasten two or more components to each other, such as this pin that's used to fasten the blade within the housing of a dipstick, and the other pin that's used to fasten the pin to the blade of the key fob. Pins are also used for locating and alignment, as in this oil pump housing. Pins are commonly used to pin a gear or a hub to a shaft. And some pin types are used to restrict flow through an assembly. In this case, since the coiled spring pin has a hole through its center, the coiled pin can be used to reduce oil, coolant, or fuel flow through the ID, such as in this automotive fuel injector. Pins are also used as stop pins to limit the travel of components, such as in this aero rest used in archery. And finally, not as common, but still worth mentioning, especially as more metal parts are converted to plastic, is when pins are used as reinforcements in plastic housings. In this example, a light duty coil pin is used in an automotive fuel reservoir made from very soft polyethylene. When a hose clamp is placed over the outside of the plastic inlet or outlet, the pins prevent the plastic from collapsing. So the common pin types that we'll focus on today are the coiled spring pins, sometimes referred to as spiral pins, roll pins, or simply spring pins, slotted spring pins, also sometimes referred to as roll pins or spring pin pins, but also called split pins, and solid pins. So coiled spring pins, which incidentally were invented by Spiral in 1948, are recognized by their two and a quarter coil cross section. Coil pins are available in light, standard, and heavy duty, enabling the design engineer to choose the strength, flexibility, and diameter to suit different host materials and application requirements. These are the only press fit pins that absorb shock and vibration after installation into a hole. Now, slotted spring pins are recognized by the vertical slot that runs down the length of the pin. These are primarily only offered in heavy duty, but you can special order these in a light duty version. As a standard, both coiled and uh, slotted pins are available in heat treated high carbon steel, 300 series stainless steel, and heat treated 420 stainless steel. High carbon steel provides good shear strength and fatigue resistance, and it's also the most economical of all standard materials. 300 series stainless steel, sometimes referred to as austenitic stainless steel, provides the best corrosion resistance. However, it's not heat treated and therefore not recommended for use in hardened holes or in applications where the pin is subject to dynamic loading as it will work hard. And this is particularly true for 300 series stainless slotted spring pins, since most of the stress is concentrated 180 degrees from the, the slot. In general, we actually wouldn't recommend a 300 series slotted pin due to the inherent design limitations of this type of spring pin. 420 stainless steel, sometimes referred to as Martin Siddick stainless, provides good corrosion resistance in most common atmospheric and environmental conditions in the presence of free oxygen. 420 stainless is heat treated and has mechanical properties similar to high carbon steel with the enhanced corrosion protection. Now, solid pins are straight, cylindrical, relatively inflexible press fit pins. There are a lot of different kinds of solid pins. They are available with or without standard retention features, such as knurls, grooves, and barbs, and they're available with or without heads. While there are literally hundreds of different types of solid pins, here are a few examples. First, we have a pin without any retention features, referred to as a straight or dowel pin. Next, we have a barbed pin, and in this case, it's our press and lock pin that has dual opposing bar barbs on either end of the pin. Next, we have a helical knurled pin where the knurl is at an angle on the pin. Then we have a straight knurled pin where the knurl goes down the length of the pin. And then a pin with barbs located just under the head. Now, solid pins are commonly made from low carbon steel, which is readily available and the most economical. For corrosion protection, you can add coatings or platings to the low carbon steel. However, it's often preferred to use stainless or aluminum if corrosion protection is required. Now, as we mentioned earlier, 
300 series stainless provides excellent corrosion protection and even though it's not heat treated it is stronger and harder than low carbon steel which is also not heat treated another option is aluminum which is one-third the weight of steel it's corrosion resistant and lead free so Per the previous slide, I mentioned that there are two different types of spring pins, coiled spring pins and slotted spring pins. The definition of a spring pin is that the diameter of the pin is larger than the hole in which it's to be installed. And during installation, the spring pin diameter either folds, as with a slotted pin, or it coils, like with a coiled pin. And if you've selected the right spring pin with the proper balance of strength and flexibility, it will do this without damaging the hole. Given that spring pins are flexible, the manufacturer can use wider hole tolerances than can be used with rigid solid pins. Once the spring pin is installed, the pin will spring back towards its original diameter, exerting a constant radial force against the hole wall. This provides self-retention of the pin and eliminates any secondary operations for retention, such as what's required with rivets. Spring pins also have lower insertion forces than other types of spring pins, and they're typically symmetrical, eliminating the need to orient them during installation. And this usually results in lower installation and assembly costs. Finally, coiled spring pins and some non-interlocking slotted pins are conducive for automatic installation since the pins do not interlock and they have quality chamfers to aid in insertion. So, this chart shows the total hole tolerance required for each common type of press fit pin. The wider the hole tolerance, the more manufacturing costs are saved. Notice for an eight millimeter pin, all right, similar to a 5 16th diameter pin, a ground dowel pin requires a total hole tolerance of 0.025 millimeters, really tight tolerance, right? Next, you have the solid grooved pin that requires 0.11 millimeters. A slotted spring pin requires a total tolerance of 0.15 millimeters. And finally, you have the coiled spring pin, which will absorb a total hole tolerance of 0.28 millimeters. This is more than double the tolerance of the grooved pin and nearly double the tolerance of the slotted pin. What this chart represents is cost savings. Now, these pictures show the differences in radial forces exerted by a solid pin, slotted pin, heavy duty coiled pin, standard duty coiled pin, and light duty coiled pin. The wavy lines observed around the pins in the plexiglass boss represent the stresses exerted by the pins. The larger the pattern, the higher the stress. Notice the size of the stress pattern of the solid and slotted pin as compared to the light duty coiled pin. The stress distribution of the solid pin is very evenly spread out, but this pin is exerting a really lot of force and stress onto the plastic. The stress with the light duty pin is minimal and it's much more evenly distributed than that of the slotted pin where there are three main regions where the pin is focused. Now, Stress in plastic eventually means elongation or relaxation, which can mean the difference between a secured joint for the intended life of the assembly or not. Incidentally, because of this, we would never recommend this particular solid pin, slotted pin, or a heavy duty coiled pin under normal circumstances in plastic. Flexibility, strength, and diameter must be in the proper relationship to each other, and to the host material to maximize the unique features of the coiled pin. A pin too stiff for the applied load will not flex, causing damage to the hole. A pin too flexible will be subject to premature fatigue. So essentially, balanced strength and flexibility must be combined with a large enough pin diameter to withstand the applied loads without damaging the hole. And that is why the coiled pins are designed with three duties, to provide a variety of combinations of strength, flexibility and diameter to suit different host materials and applications. So some general rules of thumb in terms of, you know, selecting the proper duty. Wherever space permits, use standard duty coiled pins. Standard duty has the optimum combination of strength and flexibility for use in non-ferrous and mild steel components. It's also recommended in hardened components because of its greater shock absorbing qualities. Heavy duty pins should be used in hard materials where space or design limitations rule out a larger diameter standard duty coiled pin. 
and light duty pins are recommended for soft, brittle, or thin materials and where holes are close to an edge. In situations not subjected to significant loads, light duty pins are often used because of easy installation resulting from lower insertion force. There are a few disadvantages with slotted pins. Now, slotted pins have limited flexibility, if any, after insertion. Essentially, the limitation is how much of a slot is left after installing it into a hole. The smaller the hole size, the less of a slot will be left to absorb shock and vibration. Also, in some of the smaller diameters, the pins are allowed to butt in the minimum hole, so as long as they can be successfully installed into the hole. When a slotted pin butts in a hole during installation, this drives up the insertion forces. Now, a downside to having a slotted pin that is able to flex after installation is the fact that all of the flexing is 180 degrees opposite the slot. Therefore, all of the stress is in the area in red shown in the schematic. If the pin flexes too much, it can fatigue. And this is the very reason why we would not recommend a 300 series stainless steel slotted pin for use in a dynamic application. Other common issues, especially when automating with some slotted pins, are when the slotted pins have non-square ends where the pin on the bottom of the feed tube will get caught on the pin on top of it and end up jamming the shuttle mechanism, the pin inserter. Another common issue, especially with ISO 8752 slotted pins, is one pin slides into another pin because of the width of the slot allows them to become interlocked. Obviously, this will not feed very well. The propensity for ISO 8752 pins to interlock is why some manufacturers will not provide ISO pins with any supplemental coatings because they're almost guaranteed to interlock from the extra tumbling process. Slotted pins are available per different industry standards. Common standards are ISO, ASME, and JIS. Some manufacturers like Spiral have their own standards as well. And this is important to know as you may have tried a slotted pin that didn't meet your performance expectations simply because it was a pin manufactured to an inferior standard. As a matter of fact, many issues that customers come to Spiral for are solved simply by replacing an ISO 8752 pin with a Spiral standard or ASME slotted pin. More specifically, if you ever had issues getting a slotted pin started into a hole or that required really high insertion forces, you may well have been using an ISO 8752 slotted pin, which by the way, Spiral also manufactures. This is because the ISO standard does not specify a specific chamfer diameter or um, you know, it also has a larger diameter than these other standards, so it has to flex more in order to get into the hole. Unlike the other standards, the ISO pin also does not have a straightness tolerance. Now, perhaps you've had issues with interlocked slotted pins that were totally stuck together right out of the box or that caused downtime with automatic feeding and installation equipment. Again, this is totally allowable with the ISO standard. And if you experienced issues with slotted pins failing in shear or fatigue, it could be because the ISO pins have more stress in the spine of the installed pin due to the larger free diameter. A simple fix in many cases could be to ditch the ISO 8752 pin and replace it with either the ASME or the spiral standard pin, which are drop-in replacements for all diameters except for the little teeny tiny pins less than three millimeters in diameter. And now I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thanks, Christy. So now that we've gone through spring pins, we're gonna talk about the other most common type of pin, which is a solid pin. So there's two different ways to manufacture solid pins. There's machining and there's cold heading. So with machining, you're cutting material away until you produce the desired geometry of the pin. In doing so, you're generating scrap. Now with machining, the setup times are typically two to four hours, and you can produce parts at about three to five parts per minute. Machining produces slightly tighter tolerances on the diameter tolerance compared to cold heading. Now with cold heading, you're using dyes to disrupt material into the desired geometry. This is actually exactly how screws and bolts are made but it can also be used for solid pens. With cold heading, the setup time is about six to 12 hours, so a much longer setup time. But you can produce parts at about 300 to 500 parts per minute, which is 100 times that of machining. So for this reason, in high volume opportunities, say 50,000 assemblies per year, cold heading is the preferred manufacturing method. Conversely, with low volume, 
for highly critical alignment applications, machining is the manufacturing method of choice. And one thing I do want to mention is that if you're using solid pins, it's really important that the solid pin is harder than the hole it goes into. True. So the solid pins are typically used in press fit applications, and there's two different ways to do that. The first is with the use of a dowel pin, where the pin has a larger diameter of the hole that it's going into, and it's displacing the material. Another way to use a press fit is to have a retention feature like a knurl or a barb, as you can see in these images. So when we talk about retention features, they provide a lot of benefits compared to the straight dowel pin. The dowel pins do not provide great resistance to rotation or to pull out. When we talk about straight knurls, they provide great resistance to rotation. Helical knurls provide good resistance to rotation and great resistance to pull out. Another type of knurl that people are probably very familiar with is a diamond knurl. This should actually be avoided at all costs. There's rarely a practical reason why you would use this type of pin. And the reason is it's not really resistant to rotation. and It doesn't provide good retention or resistance to pull out. In addition to that, diamond knurls literally shred the host and they create debris. So you're sacrificing the quality of your assembly. And it costs nothing more to manufacture helical or straight knurls than it does to manufacture the diamond knurls. The last type of pin geometry we have here is barbs. So with the barbs, these are specifically designed for use in plastics because plastics are soft materials. So after installation, the plastic actually backfills around the barb and seals that pin in to provide excellent retention. As Christy mentioned, it's critical that the solid pin is harder than the host so that after or during installation, the host material is deformed rather than the other way around. Now with solid pins and retention features, it's very common that the neural or barb length is customized for the application so that it matches, for example, the thickness of one of the components for which it's retained. So we're gonna go through some examples of application specific solid pins. On the left, we have press and lock pins, which has dual opposing barbs that are both facing the center of the pin. The application for this is plastic housings, as you can see in the bottom image. So press and lock pins are installed in two stages. First, all of the press and lock pins are installed into the bottom component. Then the top component is aligned and advanced with a press until the housings meet at the middle. And that completes the installation process. The nice thing about the press and lock pins is they can be used with blind holes. So in the final assembly, you can't see the actual fasteners, which provides a lot of aesthetic benefits. The press and lock pins are commonly used to replace screws and adhesives, which can be a manufacturing nightmare. And the press and lock pins provide cost savings in terms of cycle time and a lower failure rate during assembly. Another application specific solid pin is a latch pin. As you can see in the image, we have barbs under the head and then a straight section of the tenon. These are commonly used in plastic hinges as shown in the bottom image here. So what happens is the pin will go through multiple components where the pin, the tenon of the pin, is smaller than the hole size, and then the barbs lock the pin into place in this final component. As mentioned earlier, this would be the perfect example of something where you have a custom neural length because you don't want the neural to be larger than the width of the final component. Otherwise, it's going to impede the function of the actual hinge. Now that we've talked about some application-specific solid pins, we'll talk about an actual function of a pin that can, you know, you, you might want to use one pin versus another pin, depending on the design requirements. So specifically, we're talking about hinges. There's really two different types of hinges. There's friction fit hinges, which is like a laptop. When you open the laptop, there's resistance, and then the monitor stays in place. The other type of hinge is a free fit hinge, where you have one or multiple components that have a slightly larger hole size so that it's free to rotate about the axle of the pin. Now, for free fit hinges, in one example of that would be a door, where you swing a door open and it continues to move until something stops it. For free fit hinges, all three different types of pins can be used, and they're commonly used. Conversely, when it comes to friction fit, the coiled spring pin provides a great ability to be a single solution to create that friction fit. An example of that would be in a cosmetic case. Now, many manufacturers actually use either a solid pin or a coiled pin in tandem with an external torsion spring to create a friction fit. If you're doing this, you would use the geometry on the top right where you have one component or the outer components with a slightly larger hole size, and then the torsion 
resistance spring would provide the resistance and create either a fail closed or a fail open condition in the assembly. Now that we've reviewed common types of pins, you can tell that there's really a lot that goes into selecting the proper pin for your assembly. And, and one of the first things you wanna do is early on in the design stages, really understand what are the requirements and function of the pin? What are the strength requirements? Is there a shear strength requirement? What is the material of the component in which the pin will be used and be in contact with? What environment will the pin be exposed to? This goes for atmospheric corrosion as well as galvanic corrosion. What's the intended product lifetime and number of cycles that the pin will see? How is it gonna be installed? What kind of volumes are we looking at? Which again can influence, for example, cold heading versus machining. Is this intended to be a permanent or serviceable fastener? So all of these considerations, what we're really looking to do is select the optimal pin while balancing quality, performance, and cost. Now, when we say cost, it's not just the pin cost. We have to consider the pin cost, also assembly cycle time and scrap rate. Now, testing is always recommended in a min and max material conditions to guarantee that the pin will be appropriate for the application. Now, oftentimes we'll hear things like, it's just a pin, but what happens if it fails? And how does that impact your brand? So it's critical that we understand while the pin is a small part of the assembly, it's literally what holds the assembly together. Now we're gonna run through some quick examples of features, advantages, and benefits of the three different types of pins. This will tie together concepts from earlier in the presentation. So the first one, the spring pins um, being the coiled spring pin and the slotted spring pin flex to prevent hole damage during installation, whereas the solid pin does not. For that reason, and as Christy mentioned earlier, the coiled spring pin and slotted spring pin provides the ability to have the widest hole tolerance, which leads to cost savings. Coiled spring pins provide the perfect balance of strength and flexibility. And the takeaway here is oftentimes they're actually stronger than the solid pins. The reason for that is the majority of solid pins available on the market are not heat treated, whereas coiled pins commonly are. As you can see in the table, coiled spring pins often provide 10 to 30% greater shear strength than the same size solid pin when it's an unheated or non-heat treated solid pin. When it comes to static applications, all three types of pins are commonly used. Conversely, in a dynamic application, the coiled spring pin provides the optimal solution. The reason for that is that it absorbs the forces within an assembly, whereas the slotted pin and the solid pin just transfer that force onto the other components in the assembly. So really the coiled spring pin prolongs the life of an assembly. Solid pins provide the greatest resistance to axial load, which is sometimes called push out or pull out. For this reason, solid pins are permanent or tamper resistant. Conversely, the coiled spring pin and slotted sp spring pin are serviceable. So you can literally push them out of an assembly and then reinstall that same pin to tie the assembly together. As you can see in these images, there's different stress concentrations depending on which pin you select. In soft materials, the use of a slotted pin is not recommended. The reason for that, as Christy alluded to earlier, is that it creates a lot of stress on the host component. Now, Coiled spring pins exert the lowest stress on the hose, so they're ideal for use in plastics. And then when it comes to solid pins, if you're inserting a straight dowel pin into the hole, the hard to control the tolerances and you often result in very high forces. However, if you use a knurl or a barb correctly, it exerts a reasonable amount of force and does a really good job in the plastic. All three types of pins are commonly used to provide a positive stop in the assembly. You can see that in this example, the coil pin is being used to limit the rotation of the brass component about the other components. Coiled spring pins have the lowest insertion force, and really that translates to cost savings and ease of manufacturing. So all three different types of pins can be conducive to automatic feeding, but there's a caveat. As Christy mentioned earlier, not all slotted pins are created equally. ISO slotted pins have a tendency to interlock, which can jam up the feed tube and cause equipment downtime. Finally, when it comes to critical applications, especially when they're dynamic, slotted spring pins should be avoided. The reason is that all of the forces concentrate in the area opposite the slot and create a risk to your assembly. Now I'm gonna turn it back to Christy. Thank you, Jeff. 
So to wrap this up, in reality, for all common pinning applications without knowledge of the intricacies of the requirements, in most cases, all three types of pins could be used in an assembly. However, when looking at the details of the application requirements, all of the factors that Jeff just went over, it's from the specific information we can drill down to the most appropriate pin for your particular application. Better yet, partner with companies that specify um, and specialize in fastening early in the design process. Let them help you design the proper pin for your assembly. And this includes making the proper recommendations for your assembly to ensure that it goes together and stays together for the intended life of the assembly. I just want to add real quick, you know, one thing that's important, we talked about selecting the proper pin for your assembly. And it's critical if you try to use a standard product because there's, there's tens of thousands of unique items. And oftentimes if you, you know, Look at the design of the on the design stage. And it provides you know a lot of advantages down the road when you're prototyping and trying to get samples when you start up production. Especially today, <laughs> <laughs> with what's going on with supply chains and things. So absolutely, very true. Okay, so at this point we're we're at the question question and answer time, Bob. Great. Thanks, uh, Jeff and Chrissy, for a great presentation. Uh, we've got some submitted questions, so we'll get to those in just a second. If you've got a question, type it into the question window on the side of your screen and hit the submit button. And while we're answering your questions, please also complete the feedback form that's located at the bottom of the screen. A um, number of questions come in. Let's start with this one because uh, it, it came up in the, in the presentation. There was a lot said about the disadvantages of using the ISO slotted pins. So why do people keep using them? Well, I'll take this one. Um, ISO slotted pins have been around for a really long time. So usually, you know, first of all, we're, we supply the market. We manufacture them because there's a market need for them. But it's typically for legacy items or with design engineers that don't really know that there's other types of standard slotted pins to choose from. And they're not aware necessarily of the deficiencies associated with the ISO 8752 pin. And one other thing I'll say is they're not aware that you can replace that pin easily with you know, ASME or spiral standard pin usually requires zero change to the assembly. Okay. Another question has come in, how can I tell if a solid pin was machined or cold headed? So I, I can take this one. Okay. Um, so we did talk about the two manufacturing methods. One of the common ways is to look at the chamfer. Um, in machining, you, you tend to machine at a 45 degree angle. So the chamfer of a machine solid pin is very tight and clean. Whereas in cold heading, you're using dyes to create that chamfer. Ultimately, the purpose of a chamfer is just to help with ease of assembly. So it doesn't really matter what angle it's on from a practical standpoint, but by looking at the end of the chamfer, that's one of the easiest ways to tell the difference. Okay. Now we got time for one more here. And I, I think this, uh, you're talking about uh, legacy applications. This is a good one to, to touch on that. Uh, what changes are typically required when changing from a slotted pin to a coiled pin in an existing assembly? And, and what about changing from a solid pin to a coiled, you know, what, what, are, what about all of that? Okay, um, well, typically slotted pin, if you're changing from a slotted pin to a coiled pin, usually there's no changes required for the application because the coiled pin will absorb even a wider tolerance than the slotted pin. So usually it's a drop-in replacement. Um, from going from a solid pin, was it from a solid pin to a coiled pin? Yes. Um, that can be a little trickier only because if, if people have designed, for example, um, using the cosmetic case or some type of hinge application, a lot of times to accomplish a friction fit hinge with a solid pin, the designer actually purposely offsets the hole size. They'll, they'll design misalignment into the hole. If we were to replace a solid pin with a coiled pin, we would recommend that they eliminate that misalignment. It's not necessary for, you know, for the friction fit hinge. So there are some differences that would be required in going from a solid pin to a coiled pin um, in, in a lot of applications, but everything is so application dependent. Very good. Uh, that really is all the time we have for questions uh, this afternoon. If we didn't uh, have time to answer your question, we will be getting back to you via email. So I want to thank Christy and Jeff for a great presentation. And on behalf of Machine Design, I also want to thank Spiral for sponsoring today's event. And of course, thanks to all of you for joining us. Have a great rest of your day and stay safe out there.
Thank you.